As uh, we've been journeying together on this exploration of being made whole, I'm starting to see a pattern taking shape throughout scripture. I don't know if you've noticed it as well, but what seems to be unfolding is this. Sometimes the, st- the tough stuff of life, like struggles and illness and disappointment and setbacks in the hands of God can be for our ultimate benefit as well as growth. While God is not the cause of the calamity and hardship, God can use it in order to make us whole. To such degree, sometimes you have to be brought down to your knees for you to stand up in your beliefs. Let me say that again uh, for dramatic emphasis and so you can get this. Sometimes you have to be brought down to your knees in order to stand up in your beliefs. Said another way, sometimes the quickest route to standing up is from your knees. Personally, I hate saying it because I don't want to do it, but how many of you all by a show of hands can testify to this? Sometimes you have to be brought down to your knees to stand up in your beliefs. And this is something important for us to explore, especially as we spend the summer focusing our attention on healing and wholeness. Remember what we're attempting to do here. We as a faith community are going on this exploration of being made whole with the idea being if we focus our attention as well as our intention on healing and wholeness, we can turn our eyes from our disease and towards the healer of our disease. That we can counterbalance all this information we're taking in about sickness and viral spread and death rates by taking in some images of healing and wellness. That we spend the summer making some healing choices for ourselves. And lastly, prepare ourselves to minister to a group of incoming students who will need some support in their healing and wholeness upon their arrival. Moments of being brought to your knees and standing are prevalent in the fifth chapter of Mark. Join me as I read Mark 5, 21 through 42. It's a longer passage, but I I really want this uh, to sink in. Uh, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus, realizing that power had gone out from him, he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembled with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing, or some of your translations say, ignoring what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. 
Now, after he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. This is Jesus backing up a number of claims. When we find ourselves approaching Mark chapter 5, the radical thoughts of a series of parables from chapter 4 are still ringing in our ears. The multitude of apostles, disciples, and onlookers just got four blasts of kingdom theology like it came out of a fire hose. Blasts filled with all these earth-shattering wise claims. One, just like good seed grows in tended soil, good news grows in tended souls. Just like good seed dies in untended soil, good news dies in untended souls. Number two, light cannot be hidden because its purpose is to shine. Three, whether you participate or not, there is an inevitability to the growth of the kingdom of God. And fourth, this kingdom will start small, like a mustard seed, but will grow like a mustard seed grows, which can get large enough to shelter everyone. And before we can stop reeling from the blast, Jesus goes about backing up all these claims by living out kingdom before the onlookers. Jesus first goes and heals a man who was demon possessed by tending to his soul. Jesus offers peace to this man's chaos by tending to his heart. A man, scripture says, could not be tamed, is tamed by Jesus's presence and compassion. And then we get to our text, a text I typically call 12 Years, Two Women, and One Savior. A series of incidents that begin with multitudes. While Mark's gospel begins with one small mustard seed of a man in the wilderness, John the Baptist, this kingdom has already grown to a multitude. Then verse 22 informs us one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus fell at his feet. Now, I'd ask you not to miss the fact that Mark lets us know this man's name. The name Jairus is Greek and it means to shine, which like the lamp that goes on a lampstand, much like that light that can't be hidden because it betrays its intended purpose. The very moment Jairus falls to his knees before Jesus is the very moment he shines. And listen to his conviction and and confidence. This is verse 23. He pleads earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. A man who at this point has everything to lose because of his high position in the synagogue and the religious elite's low opinion of Jesus shines because sometimes you have to be brought down to your knees to stand up in your beliefs. And because of this belief, Jesus went with him and his disciples went with him and the crowd went with him. But what they didn't know was someone else was hanging on the fringes of the moment. A woman who, due to some illness, had been hemorrhaging blood for 12 years. 12 years of weariness and weakness. 12 years of of social isolation and possible ridicule. 12 years of paying doctors and failed treatments and abject disappointment after abject disappointment. But what's so amazing about this moment is all she endured during that 12 years did not weaken her resolve. She would not settle for illness being the thing that defined her life. She cut through a crowd she should not have even been near. She reaches for a man she should not even approach and touches a cloak she should never have grasped. Because verse 28 tells us she knew if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Or some of your translations say, I shall be made whole. And just as Jesus tamed a man who no one else could tame, here Jesus heals a woman that no one else could heal. 
And she finds herself on her knees in verse 33, trembling before the Lord. Why? Because sometimes you have to be brought down to your knees to stand up in your beliefs. And Jesus responds to her belief. Verse 34, he says to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Just like the paralytic, Jesus uses familial language, daughter, to welcome her back into the family of community and then offers her shalom, offers her peace, which covers wholeness, and well-being, and prosperity, and security, and intimacy, and salvation. But while all of this was happening, a 12-year-old girl is dying. And this is the moment of choosing. You've had this moment, I know. The moment your faith gets tested. The moment something is said that attempts to chip away at your hard found and hard fought for faith. We are always faced with this moment of choosing where you can hold trust in God or let it fall through your fingers like so much sand. This is a moment for Jerus because word comes to him that his daughter is dead. What do, what do you do in that moment? What, what do you do when your biggest hope seems dashed? When all of that shining confidence begins turning to discouragement? I don't know what you do, but I know what Christ attempts to do. Christ attempts to remind us what he reminds this man to do in verse 36. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Don't be afraid. Only believe. And this is such a powerful word of encouragement. What I hope you can receive today as well, because maybe the greatest adversary of your faith is fear. Fear hampers spiritual growth. Fear fosters hoarding and the overuse of non-renewable resources. Fear lessens our capacity to love those we do not know. Fear will have you standing in your arrogance instead of kneeling before God in humility. Fear just may be the greatest adversary of your faith. This was certainly the case for those Jesus encountered at the house of Jairus. See, by the time Jesus gets there, the funereal process has already begun. And, and what is true today was true back then. Jesus Christ's presence will disrupt a funeral. Scholars believe these mourners mentioned in Mark's text are the professional musicians and mourners they were typically employed by the grieving family. They, they were hired to help spur on the grieving process. And in the text, they've already found their way to Jerus' home. But the only problem with this is when Jesus comes on the scene, Christ's presence always disrupts superficial warning because with Christ's presence, life seems to always break out in the midst of death. This is why he would state in verse 39, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. And while they laughed at this in verse 40, Jesus continues to back up his claim, whether you participate or not, the kingdom will grow and will have its way. And Jesus does what we often have to do in our spiritual life. Put out the people who don't have your spiritual best interest at heart. If you have your Bibles, I, I, I want you to notice this in the text. In verse 40, before Jesus tends to the souls of Jairus and his family, he has to put the mourners out. Because oftentimes, not everyone around you, whether intentionally or unintentionally, have your spiritual best interest at heart. And a lot of times, you know who those people are. 
And yet you still allow them to be around your circle of intimacy and they suck the life out of you and they hamper your spiritual growth when the urgency of the day is for all of us to grow in deeper Christ likeness. So sometimes in love, we have to put them out so God can do what God intends to do for your growth and God's glory. Because there is a word God wants to speak over you. There is a word God wants to speak into your consciousness, into your heart, that will often drop you to your knees to get you standing up in your beliefs. The word for this little girl, Talithachum. I say to you, little girl, arise, get up. And verse 42 tells us she immediately stood up and walked. Here, we have two women inextricably tied to 12 years. One suffering that whole time from illness, one disregarded due to her age and gender in that society. One having to wake up to abject physical and societal pain every morning. One struck down with an illness before she crosses over into real womanhood, which was at age 13 at that time. Two women so different but so vastly the same because both desperately need a savior to find the healing and wholeness needed. Now, now keep in mind, it's not lost on me that many of us have just been pushed into a process of grieving the loss of our dear sister Claudette. And you may be asking, like I once did, where is Claudette's healing? Where is her wholeness? We pray in faith that God would offer her the healing we desired and that she needed. But as Sharita and I learned as we walked together in her mother's passing, and as we walk together and tending to the hearts of other people that are in the grieving process, we have come to learn that in Christ, in Christ, sometimes the best healing comes with the ultimate healing that comes when God calls them home at their passing. That sometimes the truest healing comes when you are moved beyond the veil and into the deepest intimacy with God in heaven. Oh, and I think about my dear sister Claudette, now no longer in need of a cane, now no longer burdened with Parkinson's, now caught up in the deepest intimacy with her God that happened the very moment she heard what these two women heard in our text. Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Now, little girl, I say to you, arise. So what might be a healing choice for you today? Move towards a savior that can do what no one else can do? No, no longer settling for some trauma to be the thing that defines your life? Or maybe it's to hear Jesus call you son or daughter and welcome you back into Christian community. Perhaps it's time for you to deal with some fears that you need to address. Or maybe it's time to put some people out of your life that might not have your spiritual well-being at heart. Or maybe it's time to fall to your knees as a means of standing up for your God-centered beliefs. Pray with me. Great God in heaven, you are mighty, you are able, you are worthy, and and you are a God that saves. You are a God that heals. You are a God that directs. You are a God that holds our hearts and collects our tears when we are in the grief process. And dear God, as we move into this grief process, as we worry for all those that are sick and hurting around us, we just ask that you do what you do best, God, which is show up and transform all things, not just for our growth, but for your glory, Father, for your glory, dear God, for your glory, dear creator, that you would be with us and help us and guide us to be loving presence for each other and for our world. And we acknowledge with scripture that that changes everything. We love you. And we need you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
Amen.